In 1927, a Philadelphia native, Arthur M. Young, graduated from Princeton with a degree in mathematics. He had a strong desire to invent something radically new. By December of 1928, he had settled on a project. For the next 15 years, Young would devote his energies to inventing and flying a helicopter. He set up a laboratory in the barn of his family's home and began building models. Over the next eight years, Arthur tested a variety of designs and learned a great deal about the flight characteristics of helicopters. Through these experiments, he was able to prove that independently hinged blades would follow the movement of the mast. By December of 1939, Arthur had developed a mast-mounted stabilizer bar that dramatically improved the hover performance of his models. In the next experiment, he replaced the bar with a flywheel. The helicopter model could now be remotely controlled to fly in any direction. This breakthrough led to a much more complete model that displayed the stability and flight characteristics desirable in a full-scale helicopter. Arthur used this model to demonstrate his helicopter design to Larry Bell of Bell Aircraft. Larry was instantly fascinated. By November of 1941, Young and Bell had agreed to build two helicopters, a single-seat model to prove Young's design was sound, and a two-seat version so Larry himself could get a ride. Within six months, work had started on the full-scale helicopter in what had been a vacant garage in Gardenville, New York. The Gardenville project, as it was known in those days, would last for three years. At the end of the first year, flight testing had already begun on a very basic helicopter called the Model 30. Young can be seen here lifting this helicopter off the ground for the first time. The pilot's seat was made from a wooden crate, while the ground crew had to scurry to keep the tethering cables from fouling the landing gear. By May of 1943, Bell sent Floyd Carlson, a test pilot, to the Gardenville project. Floyd was a quick study and learned to hover on his first flight. As the flight tests proceeded, Carlson encountered the first major problem in the program. When approaching a flight speed of 20 miles per hour, the helicopter began to experience increasingly violent vibrations. Arthur returned to model building and soon recreated the problem. He found that at higher speeds, the helicopter's rotor blades weren't rigid enough to maintain a smooth ride. The full-scale helicopter was fitted with a device designed by Floyd Carlson. Its purpose was to stiffen the rotor blades as they coned upward during flight. Right away, Carlson was able to break through the 20 mile per hour speed barrier. With these increased speeds came the need for more room to expand the flight regime. Wheels were attached so the helicopter could be towed across Buffalo to a small airport. Here Carlson was able to increase the helicopter speeds dramatically. He soon verified that as the helicopter flew faster, it required considerably less power. Young had already demonstrated power off landings with his model helicopter to Larry Bell. Now they had to find out if the full-scale aircraft could also land this way. The first landing was made at considerable speed with a mild flare. On the second attempt, Carlson tried a bigger flare to reduce the forward speed. The third landing used an even larger flare with disastrous results. This landing was only partially captured by the movie camera as it ran out of film. Miraculously, Carlson escaped without injury. It is early September 1943, just five months after first flight. By this time, Model 30 Ship 2 was nearing completion, and so it was decided to rebuild and modify Ship 1 to eliminate these problems while the flight test program would press forward with Ship 2. By late fall of 1943, Ship 2 had proven itself ready for demonstration flights. The first to ride was Larry Bell. A high-powered salesman with a penchant for the dramatic, Bell was quick to get this new technology into the public eye. 
the Model 30 was flown indoors for the first time at a demonstration for the Civil Air Patrol. Here Bell, in his polished fashion, assists in showing the stability and maneuverability of the helicopter. Soon Ship 1, complete with modifications, returned to the air once again and joined the demonstration circuit. At this point in the helicopter's development, Larry Bell and Arthur Young disagreed on the course that should be followed. Young wanted to continue with more radical development work. Bell saw the need for additional testing to learn more about the flight characteristics of this new aircraft. Bell won the argument and outfitted Ship 1 with cameras for further testing. But unbeknownst to Bell, Arthur Young went ahead with work on a third aircraft. He argued that a test bed would be needed to gather more data for the main engineering department. After all, they had the responsibility of designing the production helicopter. Due to its clandestine development, very little film was taken of Ship 3. Eventually, Larry Bell learned of the project and after a test flight, sanctioned it. In fact, Ship 3 was so successful that it became the basis for the Model 47, of which 10,000 were produced by Bell. The Model 47 was the first helicopter to be commercially certified, and it became a workhorse for the military as well. Even today, there are Model 47 helicopters in service in many parts of the world. And so, the Bell helicopter was born. It sprang from humble origins, a backyard inventor intent on bringing into the world a new technology, not for profit or fame, but for the simple joy of doing something that hadn't been done before. And once this technical challenge was accomplished, the Bell helicopter changed forever the face of aviation. <laughs>